All right, welcome everybody to our very first The Capacity Specialist webinar series. Uh, my name is Nazrin, I'll be introducing myself a little bit later, but the topic for today is experiential learning versus traditional learning. And we have a subtitle there, Driving Positive Change in Your People. So this will be the topic of the day. We'll have this discussion. You are free to ask questions. You are free to comment. You are free to, to, to well, if you want to use the, 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 the microphone, feel free to do so as well. Okay. Come in and let's learn and see what we, we, can, we can share with you. All right. So this is me. My name is Nazrin. Uh, we're not going to be using our webcams today so that we have full bandwidth so that we don't have any drops or any problems with uh, internet quality because uh, the camera does take quite a bit of, of uh, the, the, the internet bandwidth. So uh, I'll show you just what I look like. Uh, yes, I do look a little bit happy like this, <laughs> especially when I'm in my classroom. Uh, I am a professional learning facilitator. And what I specialize in is workplace performance skills. So uh, workplace performance skills is used to be soft skills. Uh, in the market, it used to be soft skills. But soft skills has a very bad uh, connotation. It has a very bad image, uh, just like public relations when we talk about branding, right? So when we go to clients in Malaysia, uh, where I'm from, soft skills, the clients tend to... Uh, tend to say, oh, soft skills is not as important, right? Uh, however, soft skills is very important skill. It's just that people don't see it that way. So what we started doing was we started calling it workplace performance skills. And workplace performance skills has to do with everything from thinking skills to performing skills to communicating with other people skills to leadership skills. Uh, and you'll find that problem solving, you will find strategic thinking, uh, uh, collaboration, teamwork, leadership, all falls within that. So it's not technical skills like uh, uh, Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint. So those are categorized under something else. As long as it has to do with you managing yourself, you talk, uh, talking to other people and you leading other people. So it will fall under workplace performance skills, right? Um, a little bit about myself. I was born in Malaysia, born, born and, and grew up in Malaysia. I did most of my work in Malaysia, but when I, I started uh, joining a consulting company called Accenture, that's when I had a lot more international experience. Uh, and Accenture has 300,000 staff, which means that we needed to have a very robust uh, learning and development unit to take care of all of that staff. And for seven years, that's all I did. Uh, I, I, I primarily based in Malaysia, uh, but I moved around a lot with, uh, with India, in India, Australia, the US, uh, the Philippines. In fact, I've lost count where I've been to help upskill the Accenture people wherever they are. There are five learning centers that they've, they've created and Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia is one of the, the, the nexus ones, which means that in Kuala Lumpur, we used to cater to every Accenture office in ASEAN, uh, whether it be KL, Singapore, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, Australia, yeah, Australia included. Uh, we also catered to China and India and the Middle East sometimes. So uh, I, I had a lot of fun uh, interacting with a lot of different cultures, a lot of different people over seven years. Uh, and every year was a challenge because we had to upgrade uh, how we did things. We had to keep with the trends. We had to make sure that our learning programs were interesting. They were powerful. They were high impact. They were, they were measurable so that they, they got what they paid for. So in Accenture, there was a very big push for ROI, return on investment. They wanted to make sure that, that whatever money they paid would come back many times fold in terms of the productivity in terms of the performance of their people back in their offices or back at their projects. So that's where I cut my teeth also. And so, so I say when I was uh, in, in learning and development. So now with the capacity specialist, I am a partner. I'm helping the capacity specialist to help upskill 
local Khmer Cambodian uh, uh, workforce. And our intention is to go further than that, to go to help out other countries in Indochina. So if you are not from Cambodia and you're listening in, um, be aware that we, we really want to be part and parcel of your L&D effort, uh, part and parcel of your HR effort to help upskill your people. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar today, to introduce to you some of the latest trends that, uh, that are currently being used in large corporations that can be applicable to what you have, the problems that you have, uh, uh, provide the solutions that you need. So for today, what I'll be talking about is uh, my experience and the capacity specialist experience in offering this to the market. Now, there is no one solution, of course. Every different company has a different problem. Every different company has unique challenges, which means that we cannot sell, say, one product and say, Duh, this, is, this is the solution to your problem. Uh, in, uh, what's, what's more realistic is we come in and we understand, we ask you, we work with you to find out what solution works best. And that is actually the crux of today's conversation. In that when we talk about training, usually what will happen is a trainer or a training company will come to you and say, oh, we have these courses, we have these programs, buy one, choose one. or it could be that you as, as a company, your training manager will say, oh, we're looking for communication training or we're looking for leadership training. And the training provider will say, oh, good. We have this training program. Here you go. And after the training is done, what happens is um, out of 30 participants, maybe one person becomes better. Maybe one person becomes more productive. But the other 29 people go back to being normal. Now, this is a challenge primarily because people do not learn the way they used to. This is no longer the 1940s or the 1950s. If you look at the, the, the speed at which technology is developing, you will find that people now learn in different ways, in different time frames. I'll give you an example. I mean, everybody I think here would be familiar with Facebook. If you scroll on Facebook and you see a video, the first, the first thing you would do is you look at how many minutes is that video. If, if you look at the video and it says 6 minutes, 23 seconds, I will bet you that most of us will just scroll ahead. No, I don't have time to, to watch this video for 6 minutes. But if the video goes 36 seconds, mm, okay, I'm gonna, I'll spend my time to watch that. So the human brain nowadays, because of so much information, we find ourselves difficult to pay attention and when it's more difficult to pay attention the trainer has to do more in order to keep that attention uh, i have met many trainers who say oh it's so difficult to teach nowadays people don't pay attention the participants are undisciplined the people they don't pay they they, they don't give us the respect we, we we used to get and i say that's true because once upon a time Training was, you know, I'm the expert standing in front of you. You, dear participants, listen to me. So it was a very dictator type of relationship. However, as most trainers, and I believe a lot of you will agree with me because you have had the same experience, um, younger participants or newer participants will not be able to accept that kind of approach, those kinds of old school training. And we are not saying that is bad. We're just saying that there was a time for it. Now, with new times, we need to use new technology. We need to use new things. And I bet you in 20 years' time, even this webinar will be outdated. But for now, in 2019, what can we offer you? What can we, sh we share with you? So the term that we've proposed to you is what we call experiential learning. And in experiential learning, there are many, many tools out there. So many tools. Every day, I see a new one. We're going to talk to you only about four so far. Right? And hopefully these four will resonate with you as, hey, this is interesting. I think I need this for my organization. Or I need two of these tools. I need three of these tools. I need all four of these tools. So we hope you get something to take back to discuss with your L&D teams, with your CEOs, and see what you would like to implement. Right. So the first question is, why experiential learning? Well, let's define that first. 
the word experiential means that you learn through experience. Now, this is a little bit uh, confusing to some people because they go, wait, I learn through experience all the time. And we say, yes, that's true. However, when it comes to formal education, like in school or in university and in training, what happens is a lot of the times you sit down and the trainer talks, shows a slide, and they show bullet points. <laughs> and all you have to do is copy down. But when do you use it? I like to say this to my participants. You write down things in your book. Eventually, your workbook becomes smarter than you because you don't get to apply it. So the, the idea is during a two-day program, for example, when do you actually learn? What is considered learning? Well, if I were to give you an example, and, and uh, if some of you have children or some of you have nephews, nieces, you would have noticed this, right? When we were growing up, we did not learn theory first. If we were learning to ride our bicycle, our father did not teach us the theory of physics, of balance, inertia, equilibrium, nothing at all. Our father would say, here you go, ride the bike, be careful, right? So what we learn from is we learn from experience first and we made mistakes and we learn from mistakes. Only then when we went to school, then we learned about physics. Oh, I see. Now I understand why the bicycle doesn't fall down the, when you cycle. The slower you cycle, you will fall down. The faster you cycle, you, you will not fall down. So it's about learning from experience first and then understanding the theory. Now here's the challenge, here's the problem. Um, a lot of our education, uh, maybe secondary education, maybe tertiary education in universities, they flip it the other way around. They would teach you theory first and then in many cases not even have time to give you the experience. So what, what, what would be the best then? Imagine this, your son or your daughter comes up to you while you are, you, while you are sitting down drinking a hot cup of coffee. So if your son wants to touch the cup, and you go, no, no, don't touch, it's hot. Does he understand if he's never known what hot is? He hears the word hot, but what does it mean? There is no experience. So what my teacher taught me was say, you know, Nazrin, when you have children, you want to introduce them to the experience first and then name the experience. So he gives me an example. He says, if your son comes up to you while you're holding a hot cup of coffee, take his hand and very carefully, just tap it on the cup, right? Don't hurt him, of course, don't burn him, but tap it. And he goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. And he has no words. This boy is so young, so uneducated, he has no words. So what do you say to him? Well, son, that is hot. Th this is what is known as hot. So don't touch. So if you teach a child with experience first, they understand it physically, they understand it emotionally, they understand it logically. And that's how human beings learn. Unfortunately, with formal education, uh, it becomes difficult because we assume that human beings, oh, it's their responsibility, they should understand it themselves. That is okay in university. When it comes to a two-day training, how much information can you learn? How much information can you understand in two days? Sometimes trainers are just throwing in a lot of things, a lot of slides, a lot of bullet points. And if you've ever seen this happen, a trainer goes, oh, I'll skip over these slides because, oh, that's not important. If it wasn't important, why did he have those slides in the first place? It means that it was not planned well. It means that the information was mixed. So when it comes to experiential learning, we flip it. We no longer talk about training. We talk about learning. So what's the difference between training and learning? Well, training is what you do to people, right? What do you do to a dog? You train a dog. What do you do, do to a horse? You train a horse. What do you do to an athlete? You train an athlete. What about learning? Well, learning is not what the trainer does. Learning is what you as a participant do. So if I want to understand how to teach you, how to, to make you understand something, I need to understand how you learn. In the education industry, this is called student-centered learning. Student-centered learning means understanding the psychology of how students learn, understanding the psychology of how students listen, how they see, and how they practice. 
So if we flip it from training to learning, what we do then is we figure out how to change what we do to help them understand. I'll give you an example. Customer service is not about the company. It's about the customer. Imagine if customer service is only about giving the customer what we want to give, not what the customer needs. Then you find that, no, that's very strange. Why is a company giving a customer what the company wants to give? It should be giving the customer what the customer needs. Same thing. Why is a trainer giving a participant what the trainer wants to give? And you imagine this, right? Oh, I'm writing a speech. Here's what I want to tell them. Here's what I want to tell the people listening. If you flip it and you do more research and you understand what do my listeners want to hear. Now, interestingly, all of this research is done in you know, TV stations, radio stations, uh, movie makers. They ask, okay, in 2019, what kind of movies do you think uh, people want to watch? Let's make those movies. How about if we go, let's make a movie that, that we want to show them, right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as if you understand what people want to watch. So if we flip it from less training to more learning, then we will understand how we can create an environment for people to learn. So I saw a question. I like this. Okay. Can I challenge you? Uh, challenge with you, if we let someone participate to get with training first, thus some cases he or she gets lost one time already, some case cause for die or loss money or reputation. That's interesting. Uh, what you're saying is we allow them to learn on their own. Is that correct? You're saying that uh, we don't guide them at all. All right. Thank you very much. So experiential learning, good news, <laughs> is not about letting them go on their own. <laughs> if you remember what I just said, we as the father, we don't say, okay, son, go around this house, run around this house and, and experience it and you know, you might die. <laughs> no, that's not the case. You will still need someone to control the learning process. However, it is not about what we want to teach them. It's about what they need to learn. So there will still need to be someone there. There will still need to be someone to do that. And what do we call that process? Well, we call it learning facilitation. But the question, the answer to your question is actually this. So learning facilitation means that someone who is a trainer needs to learn to talk less and allow them to experiment more. But learning facilitation, like what a facilitator does, is control the process, not control the output, nor control the, 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 the length of time. So a learning facilitation is, is a well-designed uh, way of doing this so that the trainer is no longer, what we say, a public speaker. They, they can now help their participants to understand. So how do we do this? Well, you will have seen pictures like this, right? You would have seen, okay, this is, uh, oh, this is easy. Even my trainer does this. I've seen trainers do this, right? So let's take a step back. If we said that learning facilitation is understanding how they learn, then if trainers just do this, this is going to be copy and paste. They need to understand what's behind that. So if we were to take a dip into a different methodologies, one methodology is called neuro-linguistic programming. In neuro-linguistic programming, we say that there are different channels of learning. How do you hack a computer, for example, there will need to be ways to get into the computer. So physically, you would need to use the keyboard to hack in. You would need to use uh, 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 the USB port to hack in. Uh, each and every one of these ways requires you to access the hard disk in a, in, in a computer. If we are trainers and we want to facilitate their learning, we need to understand how to hack into their brains. And... We don't have USB ports. We don't have keyboards. The only way to hack into the brain is through the senses. So every human being has five basic senses. We actually have a lot more. We have dozens, which include sensors for heat, sensors for balance, sensors for, for pressure. We have all of that. Uh, but the classical five, of course, the eyes, the ears, 
the body, the, the skin touch, we have smell and we have uh, taste. However, when we do public speaking, when we do training, we cannot impact all five unless you are a chef. So if you are a chef in, in the kitchen, then you can teach people using the visual channel, the auditory channel, the kinesthetic channel, the uh, olfactory channel, which is the sense of smell, and the gastrotory channel, which is the sense of taste. So unless you can do that, then you will not be able to use all five. But as a trainer, as a learning facilitator, the best you can use is these three. So we say that you want to plan your activities to, to, to move around all three. I have seen trainers who are very, uh, very strict on having slides of bullet points only. And you, you must know that after a certain number of bullet points, the brain just switches off. The general trend, uh, sorry, the general tip is no more than nine bullet points. Nine is the maximum. If you see a slide that has more than nine bullet points, you just ask anybody in, in, the, in the audience, do you remember all nine? No, <laughs> nobody remembers nine and above. Uh, however, nice number would be between five to seven. If you need to go above seven or above nine, then you split it up into two different slides. Or if you have too much information, then you don't put it on the slides at all. You put it in the notes, you put it in the workbook, not for them to see on the slides, but for them to reference later on. So the slides are for people to see at one time, and then it changes to a different slide. Nobody will remember which means that the information has to be bite-sized. It has to be small. It cannot be big. Look through, look through Facebook, look at Instagram. When there's too much information, you don't remember. And now that advertising is, there's, there's so, many, so many distractions, advertising is struggling to be able to keep your attention. A, a simple example, right? If you're watching a YouTube video now, before the YouTube video starts, there is now an advert, there's a commercial every single time but if the commercial is more than seven seconds long right there's a button that, that goes five four three two one and you're waiting you are waiting to tap skip ad but has it happened where you're watching a youtube video the ad comes on and you actually watch the ad you don't actually skip why because they understand that they only have a few seconds to capture your attention so that's the same with training as well. If you just move on and on and on and on, uh, the general accepted uh, maximum is three minutes. People can pay attention. Any more than three minutes, then people die. So you need to have a lot of variety in what you do. And learning facilitation, make sure that you stick to these rules. right? So again, you go through the senses. Second is you also understand that there are different types of people. Not that there are so many senses, but there are different types of people. So not just you play videos, not just you show pictures, not just you, you play songs, not just you talk. You also do activities. You also have, have things for them to do within the time allocated. But understanding different types of people will mean understanding that different people have different learning styles. For example, there are some people who are hard and fast. They're very task-oriented. When they come into this session, they go, okay, I want to learn something. Why is this guy talking so slowly? So driving people, and I'll give you an example of a driving person everybody should know, Donald Trump, right? Donald Trump is hard and fast. He's the kind of person who says, um, uh, if I don't like you, I'll tell you. Right? If I don't like this trainer, I'll tell this trainer. Uh, I think I want to challenge this trainer up front. So driving people are very results-oriented. And if you can create your learning program, you can create your, your learning event to have results, evidence, straight up front, then you will capture the driving person very immediately. You also have these expressive people. Expressive people love to make jokes. They love to tell jokes during the class. And if you are someone who cannot manage that kind of person, then you shut them down and you say, please, this place is for training, it's not for making fun. They'll go, oh, okay. And you will have lost one quarter of the crowd who actually enjoys the, that interaction. A good learning facilitator laughs along with their jokes and can actually extract learning from those jokes to put into the actual program while it happens. So if you do this, what happens is you allow them to express themselves. You allow them to, 
to, to be part of the learning rather than, oh, listen to me. You will also have the quieter ones like the amiables and the analyticals. These people, you know, when you're having meetings in the company, you'll find that these people tend to keep quiet the most. If you ask them, okay, anybody have any ideas? These are the people who will not put their hands up. These are the people who will not give any ideas because not because they're shy, but sometimes because of history. Sometimes they think, okay, I have shared an idea in this meeting before, but somebody said it was a stupid idea. So I'm not going to share again. So analyticals who think a lot before they talk and amiables who will go along with anything you say, you will find these people in your training programs. And if you ask them, okay, so how was the training program? And they'll say, oh, it was, it was okay. But then when you read the, the, the evaluation forms, they are the ones who give you very low scores. Why did they lie to you? Well, because they did not feel safe to tell you the truth. So understanding that there are four different types of people, you as a learning facilitator need to create a safe learning environment. And a safe learning environment means that everybody can process, can learn at their own pace according to their own learning style. So if a driver shuts down an email by saying, that's a stupid idea, you as a facilitator has to say, hang on a sec, let him talk because I really want to hear his idea. And what that does is it, it makes the, 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 the classroom, it makes your classroom a safe place for them to share their ideas, for them to speak out. Otherwise, you will notice that only the most vocal people in your training programs conquer everything. And I think you know what I'm talking about. These vocal people in your meetings do the same. So if they're vocal in trainings, they're vocal everywhere else. So a learning facilitator has to make sure that everybody learns, everybody enjoys themselves. So I'm going to pause right here and ask if you have any questions. So please don't be amiable today. Don't be analytical today. Ask me questions and ask me challenging questions. Thank you. Because that will, will help me to think about how I can help you. Right? So if you don't understand something, type into the text chat and ask me your questions. I'm going to be quiet for 10 seconds to allow you time to, to, to type in. If I don't see any questions after 10 seconds, I will assume you don't have questions and I shall move on. All right, here we go. Type into the text chat what questions you have. Okay, so Simon, thank you very much. Uh, driving people, and I give you an example just now, some, so somebody like Donald Trump, somebody like my own Prime Minister, Dr. Uh, Tun, Dr. Mahade, Prime Minister of Malaysia. These people, they, they work fast. They expect things fast. They also make decisions very fast. Why? Because they're very learned. They, they know exactly what they want. So you will find that sometimes in your classrooms, this is the person who will challenge you top, bottom, left and right. Will go, Are you sure? How do you know? I've read somewhere that this is not true. So if you are not prepared to deal with someone like this, you might think, oh, they are rude. They are trying to control your training. The fact is they're not. For them, these people say, I, I spend my time coming to your training. I'm not seeing any value. Why are you doing this? So they speak up. And in Southeast Asian culture, um, including Malaysia, we find that these driving people can be one of two, two uh, approaches. One is, okay, if I speak up, people will say I'm rude, people will say I'm controlling. So I will sit down and keep quiet and just make a face. So you, you can actually detect these people in the classroom. They make a face, they just look unsatisfied the whole time. Or the second, second type of, of driver is they will speak up. They don't care who you are, what, what you think. They will challenge you on the spot. They will ask you questions. They will actually disagree with you. So a learning facilitator is someone who can actually take that, agree with that, make sense of that, and put that, take that as part of the learning. So does that answer your question, Sivon? All right. So Sapai asked this question, how to facilitate training when we have mixed group of participants? Well, number one, when you say mixed, you can be mixed levels, mixed, mixed within the organization. It can be mixed in terms of generation gap. It can be mixed in terms of uh, education levels. So which one are you referring to, Sapai? So while we're waiting for, okay, mixed learning styles. Well, the answer is this. Because everybody has mixed learning styles, then you need to give them 
what they need. Um, you can't give everyone everything at the same time, but you plan into your program. For example, driving people, they are very results oriented. So you must make sure that you have evidence standing by. Analyticals are people who love problem solving activities. So you must have that standing by as well. It must be part and parcel of your design. Expressive people love activities where they have to run around and do things. So you must have activities that are very kinesthetic, very, very enjoyable. And amiables are people who are relationship oriented. So you want to have activities that, that cater to their being to connect with people, talk to people and feel safe with people. Right? So does that answer your question? Hi, hi Nasin. Hello. Hi. Yeah, I'm Sibon. Thank you very much for your um, explanation. Uh, hi, I'm very much uh, interested with the learning style. Okay. When we are the facilitator and then we can find out the, the four different kind of the people. I mean, right. Four different kind of the participants. Uh, one uh, one group of the participants are the driving people, more children, more understanding, uh, get understanding easily, learn yep. faster. and uh, some group is uh, expressive. I mean, uh, this group like the joking or funny uh, activity, uh, gaming, and some uh, shy, be quiet, not brave enough to talk and to express in the group. And some people are the thinking person and uh, just thinking and uh, keep quiet and sometimes respond to us. So, as we are the trainer, how can we, we identify, uh, as we are the, the good trainer, how can we manage uh, these four different kinds of the people? But okay. we manage the group. We need to divide a group separately or we should. Uh, make them uh, into the group. Okay, so your question, if I understand it right, thank you very much for that, uh, is two parts. Number one is first, how do we identify? And second, how do we manage? Is that correct? Okay, okay, yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. good. So that answer is actually a two-day course. <laughs> actually a two-day course. But simply, um, driving people are the first ones to put their hands up and ask questions. So you can identify, okay, this is either a driver or an expressive. If the question is sarcastic, very rarely would, you, would that be a driver. Usually a driver asks very pointed, very challenging questions. So analyticals and amiables, they, they tend to ask questions that are more factual, more, more data oriented. And they speak very slowly. So in terms of identifying who they are, as a good learning facilitator and someone who studies the learning styles, from their behavior, you can tell. From their body language, from their voice intonation, from their facial expression, it is, it is, it is quite easy to figure out. However, because I don't want to spend too much of my brain power doing that, what I normally do is I give every participant an activity to do at the beginning of the program. So uh, we have a couple of people who have been in my program here. Tariq is here from uh, uh, Commit My, I think. So uh, he knows that my at the beginning of every my program, I will do an activity called Human Bingo, and Human Bingo is where you have to run around getting signatures. Now, how do you know when someone is a particular learning style? You look at their behavior, and how to to get them to show their real behavior is you need to give them an activity that is time oriented. That means there's less time, there's pressure, social pressure to get it done, right? And there's less resource. So when you have an activity that has all three, they start panicking. When they panic, they show you their true selves. And a driver will run up to someone and say, sign for me, sign for me. Mm -hmm. An expressive will just enjoy the process. <laughs> They'll run around. So an amiable will just look lost. They will look sad because nobody wants to sign for them. Uh, and, and analytical, you can see you can see them planning. Okay, who do I get to sign for me first? Who do I get to sign for me next? Um, that for me does it very fast. Otherwise, they will be acting. Right? <laughs> Throughout the course, they will be acting. Or oh, I need to act uh, like like I'm very good person, like a very good participant. So what I would say is uh, first to read is to give them high pressure activities so that you see who comes up. 
the driver will start blaming you. What kind of activity is this? This is a stupid activity. So you can say, okay, that, I, I, I know who that is. Now, it's also good to manage your emotions. As a learning facilitator, don't be easily triggered by any of your participants. Understand that they are different. Understand that they, are, they have different priorities in life and they have different ideas on education. For example, a driver, even in work, their priority or their philosophy of education is, if I want my people to grow, I must press them, I must give them pressure, I must make it hard for them, and they will grow. Uh, but it doesn't work on everybody. Right? It works in the military, but it doesn't work for everybody. So because there are different learning styles, you must also be adaptable in your facilitation styles. That's number one in terms of managing. Number two is you must protect the analyticals and the amiables from the driving and the expressive people. Because when they talk, they talk over other people. They cut over other people. They don't allow the amiables and analyticals to talk. So you have half the class, maybe, who just doesn't want to participate because these people are, uh, what's the word, uh, dominating. So managing each uh, driving and expressive, for example, is more about getting them to give chance to other people giving them um, leadership responsibility would say, okay, you've had your, your chance now. How about you give someone else the opportunity to answer? That would be good for you. And giving the analyticals and enables a safe space, right? Protecting them from other people who laugh at them, protecting them from other people who, who, who knock down their ideas. So while the activity is happening, for example, you see an enable put their hand up, but only halfway. And then someone talks over them. It's your responsibility to say, hang on a sec. She had her hand up. Let, let's listen to what she has to say. So your, your role is not to tell them what to do, but your role is to guide and make sure it's a safe learning environment. Does that answer the question? A longer answer is, is available in a two-day course, but does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So Tariq asked me, uh, how do you how do you deal with participants obsessively analytical and expressive? Well, an expressive is someone who likes to laugh a lot, who likes to to make jokes a lot. Uh, what I normally do is I laugh along with the joke, and every couple couple of times whenever I I say something, I will point to this guy and say, "Isn't that right? Isn't that right?" Uh, and he will support he or she will support me. Uh, in terms of analyticals, I think I gave you part of an answer. You can talk to them during the break or during lunch, right? But easily, if they are, they are so analytical that they will not answer, then what you do is you can shift around the teams, change constantly, make sure that they're not sitting in the same teams, and give them the opportunity to, to speak up, right? There's the, there's, it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, my answer is, a, is too simple. But again, we can certainly talk about that later, okay? So somebody here is presentation. If I'm not amiable and analytical, uh, the same in the remaining side, how can you identify them? Well, if they are remaining silent, but they're not driving and expressive, it, it probably means that they've had bad experience in previous training before, or they don't like you. They just don't like the trainer. So what you need to do from the very beginning is to build a lot of rapport, build a lot of uh, commonalities between you and them to make them trust you. So that's also part of learning facilitation. Uh, first thing in the morning is not to introduce yourself and tell them how fantastic you are. I've had trainers, I've seen trainers introduce themselves for 30 minutes, sometimes up to two hours, saying how fantastic they are, what kind of work they've done before. That does not build a, a lot of credibility and trust. Have them interact with you as a human being. So instead of identifying them, they will identify themselves to you. Usually when the break comes or the lunch comes, they will not ask questions during the class, they'll ask questions due <laughs> when they have you one-on-one, -on -one. all right? So I presentation, I think I don't have your name here. I hope that answers that question. Okay, is it a good way we get driving learning to be part of us? The answer is yes. And there are many ways to do that. Uh, uh, one, one way is to get them to, to share their experiences and use that experience in the case studies, use that experience in, in, uh, in everything that, that, that we teach. So uh, not as a subject matter expert, but whenever they want to talk, take what they say, and then use it. And if they like to talk, sooner or later they'll realize, okay, anything I say, this trainer is going to use. So I better not. I better keep quiet uh, because it's going to be published everywhere. It's going to be be, be public to in all class. Okay. So Tarek says, to my perspective, it's hard to identify different kinds of participants. 
Uh, okay, so he's he's uh, he's giving giving uh, his experience. Thank you very much. By the way, Tariq is uh, a learning facilitator. He's a certified professional learning facilitator, uh, and uh, was was in my class. So he actually understands what what I'm talking about more than than uh, I think a few other people here. Uh, Tariq, if you you like to share in the text chat, please feel free to do so. Don't hold yourself back. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. This is very, very uh, interactive. Uh, not many analyticals or amiables, maybe. <laughs> or maybe I, because I challenge you, don't be amiable today. That's very good. All right. Now, in terms of uh, gamification, if you've heard of the term gamification, some people, when they do gamification, what they do instead is actually games. And games are different from gamification. There are three different terminologies that we use. Games are things that you play. So, for example, chess. Chess is a game. Why do you play chess? To win, right? The second thing is what we call game-based learning. Okay, uh, Rengzi, if you could type into the text chat for me, that would be very helpful. So, the first one, number one is games. It's what you play. So, chess, checkers, um, what else do we have? Sports, sports fall into games as well. So, anything that has a reward at the end or maybe a success at the end. That's called a game. Game-based learning is using games within a training program to make it more interesting. The third term is what we call gamification. Gamification says that you incorporate the games as part of the program for them to learn different skills and behaviors. So, for example, I am sure you have seen on the internet now, um, local councils, right? Local housing councils, they want to help change the behavior of people. So, what they do is they make it fun for people to change the behavior. For example, they have uh, trash cans. I don't know what you call it, rubbish bins uh, on the side of the street. Every time you throw rubbish in, you will, it plays a song. So gamification is getting you to change behavior, getting you to master a skill, practice something in order to become better. And at the end, you get a reward. So you'll see that on your phones, there will be an app or two. If you want to learn a language, for example, there is an app called Duolingo, D-U-O, Lingo. And in Duolingo, whenever you learn a new language or different parts or different adjectives, you get a star, you get a reward you get uh, uh, points, you get, uh, uh, you get a trophy. Now, those things aren't real, of course. It's just a picture of a trophy. Uh, but in organizations, what they do is they actually uh, replace that with cash items or money or you know, uh, um, a monthly award, for example. So gamification is how do you help people change to a more positive behavior using games? However, what we do based on the theory of gamification is that we say that because there are four different learning styles, each learning style has two separate human drives. And you ask yourself, whenever you want to do something, whenever you get excited about something, it's one of these eight different drives. So between analytical, amiable, driver, and expressive, you have unpredictability versus accomplishment. Between political driver and amiable expressive, you have scarcity and empowerment. Between driver and amiable directly, you have social influence and ownership. Between analytical and expressive directly, you have, you have avoidance and, express, uh, uh, and meaning. So I'm not going to go through all eight because uh, we're coming up to the end of our session. Let me just say this. If we were to have an activity in our program that is ownership oriented, what is ownership? It means that I want this and we have a game, you will find that only the drivers will rush for it because they're very results oriented. The amiables will not enjoy it as much. However, if you have an activity that is social influence oriented, like say, okay, um, I want you to go around and ask everybody's name. I want you to remember everybody's name. The driver will go, that is not practical at all. Why would I play that? But the amiable will enjoy it. So the eight human drives says that you can design your program to be balanced in all directions so that everybody gets what they need in terms of uh, according to their drives. 
And the best part is all human beings have all eight drives. So when you design something, you need to make sure that it's not too much to the right or too much to the left or too much to the top or too much to the bottom. So I'm going to pause right now and see if you have any questions. What questions do you have? Please type into the text chat. I will wait for 10 seconds. Now, while waiting for the questions, I understand that this might be challenging to, to imagine because if you've never seen it happen before, uh, you might think, uh, okay, oh, any trainer plays games. That's true. But if the, tra if the trainer cannot explain why they play a particular game, what is the debrief? What is the outcome? What is the learning that they get at the end of it? Then that is not gamification because gamification needs to not just select the type of activity, but it also needs to select why we're doing this activity. What is the debrief at the end? Okay. So while, while I'm waiting for questions, um, uh, I like to play a game called the name game. And I want you to imagine this. If you need to close your eyes, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I have say up to 10 participants standing in a circle facing inside. And I say to them, okay, I want you to do three things. I want you to say your own name. I want you to point to someone else in the circle. And I want you to walk towards that person. Whenever we do that, the next person that they choose has to do the same three things. Say their name, point to someone else, and walk in that circle. They have to replace the person they're pointing to. So can you imagine if I say walk, but some people start running. It means that they only care about themselves. They don't care about the person they're pointing to because the other person starts panicking. Oh my God, he's already coming. I, I don't have time to leave. So what can be the debrief? It's a game. It's a game that children can play. But what is the debrief? What is the learning? We say, well, in terms of communication, you care more about your job than you care about the next person's job. So for example, if you create a report and then you send the report to someone else, but it's full of typos or there's so many mistakes and you go, well, my job is over. That's your job now. So the learning that they get is, okay, I'm being selfish as a communicator. I tell people things, but I don't care whether they understand it or not. So we flip this is the same thing as when, and we talk about training versus learning. Instead of giving them what we want to give, we need to understand what they need to get. We need to understand what they need to learn. In the sense, in communication, we need to understand what they need to understand before we talk to them, before we type that email. All right. So far, Sivon is the only person who has a question. So let me just ask, uh, answer this. Can you just do a briefing for eight components, ownership, accomplishment, meaning? What does it mean and use for what condition? All right. So I will go high level, yeah? Scarcity is... Uh, when there are less resources. So, for example, um, when there is lack of food, food prices go up. That is scarcity. So if I were to say, okay, there are, um, let me just get a, a, a show of hands. How many people has played musical chairs before? Please type in yes or no. Musical chairs. Has anybody gone to a birthday party and played musical chairs? Okay, yes, no, yes. <laughs> We're getting uh, more no's than yes. All right. So I can't use that example then. So scarcity is if there are 10 people and there are nine chairs, people are going to be rushing for those chairs. So the activity that you run with a, as a, from a scarcity perspective is you say, okay, there's only five balls. There's 10 of you. So whoever gets the ball first wins. Oh, <laughs> But okay, there's 10 balls, there's 10 people. No pressure whatsoever. So there is no impetus. There's no want to change. There's no want to, to, to go faster. Okay, so that's scarcity. In terms of avoidance, we say, okay, you either do a good job or no salary for you this month. So they want to avoid losing their salary. Uh, okay, the first, first team to complete this activity gets to go for lunch first. So, of course, they, they want to avoid going for lunch late. Okay? I don't know if trainers have done that before. It's a bit unfair, but I have. <laughs> it works very well. Everybody finishes on time. Unpredictability is when you give them an activity and you don't tell them what time is going to finish. So, I say, okay, 
this activity is going to run and suddenly I'm going to change one of your participants to another team. So if you need this participant, right, you will have to work with them fast. Right? So in some, some activities, you'll notice trainers will swap out participants, sometimes to, to mimic a, a corporate transfer. Right? So, so, and how do you adjust to a new environment? How do you adjust to a new team member? So unpredictability is that. Empowerment is how do you get people to take responsibility for themselves? Uh, and I have an activity I, I run called the traffic jam. I won't explain it. But at the end of the activity, everybody has to make decisions for themselves. They cannot just ask the person next to them. They cannot, they cannot talk to, to everyone else in the team. They have to decide what's right. So that means that they have to find deep inside themselves that critical thinking aspect and they go, okay. And at the end of the activity, they become more empowered. Another activity of empowerment uh, I've used before, Tariq has gone through this uh, in the professional learning facilitator program. Uh, to improve your public speaking skills and remove your stage fright, we have one person standing in front delivering their topic for three minutes and everybody else throws balls at them. Uh, everybody tries to distract them from talking. We use bells, we use horns, uh, we, we, we boo them. Okay, so that might sound a little bit unfair, <laughs> but when you come for the program, you'll understand what, what that's for. So we're, quite, we're very, very nice to them. We build them up, build their courage up before the activity. So that's empowerment. We give them the sense of, yes, I can do this. All right. Uh, in terms of meaning, meaning is getting people to find a purpose in life. Getting people to find, okay, why do they work at this company? Is it just for the salary? Is it just for this? Is it just for that? So they need to create that meaning for themselves. That uh, I'm working here because... I want to improve myself as an employee. I want to improve myself, improve my skills. And this is, this is quite challenging because not everybody can get past this. Uh, a lot of people have mothers who are sick at home and they just depend on the salary. They don't find that working is important except for just the money, right? So did I cover everything? Accomplishment, ownership, scarcity, avoidance, unpredictability, social influence, and empowerment? If yes, please, please type in yes. And, and we can certainly have that conversation more further, going further uh, uh, in the future. Just contact us and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. All right, so Tariq, is that a question or, or a comment? Okay, so imagine we have four different participants. Here. Shall we prepare the games you mentioned to let them feel the experience of learning will last only one day? Okay, so it's, it's uh, in many cases, you need to design the program and then test it out first. <laughs> You cannot just say, oh, I am a fantastic learning designer. So, uh, and Tariq, you'll remember me saying this to you uh, during the program, right? Uh, design the program, test it out a couple of times, make changes until you find that everybody can, uh, wants to be involved in the activities. So personally, myself, when I design a program, uh, I tend to test it on my friends first, my fellow trainers, because they give the, the most detailed and most critical answers. They are the ones who, you know, are very honest with me to say, okay, this doesn't work. Change this, Nazrin. Okay, I'll change it. Uh, and then second, I will test it on a, a, a test batch. Anybody who wants to come for my free course, for example, uh, you get the learning. But then at the end, you, you don't pay anything. It's free. But you must give me comments in terms of uh, how to improve. And then you can run it on a real-life audience and continuously make changes. So I have no comment, but just like to check if you have sample training design program. Can you explain to me what does that mean, a sample training design program? Uh, are you asking for uh, what a normal program from TCS would look like? Is that it? Yes or no? So, Pep? Okay, so I think what you're asking for is an outline. Uh, Ringze and, and Peck, you're online, you can hear this. Maybe you can interact with, with Sophia and, and uh, send something, a sample, for example. Uh, but for the rest of you, just to answer that question, the training design will, what, what can be, uh, we, we can talk about is the learning plan. So the learning plan will have uh, divisions of topics from morning until evening, until the end of the day. And it will also have 
the types of activities categorized by visual activities, auditory activities, and kinesthetic activities. And each of these, oh, sorry, kinesthetic activities, and each of these activities will be classified as either one or two of these uh, human drives, so that as a, as a trainer, as a learning facilitator, you get to see a, a dashboard. You get to see a summary of your program uh, and what works and what doesn't work. So that from a trainer's perspective, from a trainer's perspective, not a participant's perspective, that's how you design it. So think of it as a, uh, the script of the movie. The director sees the script and he imagines the movie. You as a learning facilitator, you design it on a learning plan, you see the training program. What is experienced by the participants is what we design for them. At the same time, you are not perfect, you're a human being, so you must always test it again and again and again until you find that, oh, this works really well for 2019. For 2020, you have to test it again, you have to make upgrades. Because any training program nowadays that is not upgraded every year will become left behind. Um, because the case studies start becoming older, the terminology start becoming use, uh, uh, non-practical, people don't understand it anymore, all right? So, if there are no more questions, we have only one uh, that we can touch upon right now, which is coaching. And I'm going to ask, how many people know what coaching is? Please type in the text chat, yes or no. Please type in the text chat, yes or no, all right? Everyone knows what coaching is? Okay, so it looks like everyone knows what coaching is. Uh, and can I ask, is coaching done in your organization? Please type yes with a capital Y so I know to differentiate from the previous yes. Is it currently being used in your organization? Okay, that's good. Uh, Sapeep says not sure. Okay, so just for everybody's sake, let's define it for a while. Coaching is not training and coaching is not teaching and coaching is not mentoring. Coaching is when one person becomes an external brain to help a coachee, to help an employee problem solve. So without giving any actual input, the coach only is a master of the process of thinking. So even if I'm a coaching someone who wants to open a flower shop, a florist, right? I don't need to know anything about flowers. I don't need to know anything about business, but I coach them through the process until they find their will, which is their strength, their emotion, their, 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 their ability to want something, and their level of skill, whether they, they, they are ready or not, who should they learn from, things like that. So I want to differentiate between these terms. A mentor, I'm typing there, is a subject matter expert. If you want to open a florist, a, a flower shop, go find someone who has opened the flower shop before. If you want um, skills, then you go to a trainer or a learning facilitator, right? If you want to improve your productivity, you want to improve how well you do something, then you look for a coach. Now, uh, a good trainer is someone who can be a mentor and a, and a learning facilitator and a coach, right? So coaching uh, is only one tool that can be mixed and matched with other tools. It's, uh, we're not saying that a coach uh, on, use only coaching. No, that's, that's not the case. Uh, in your organizations, there are different tools that you can use, which is learning facilitation, gamification, and coaching as well. All right? So it looks like everybody says yes. I'm going to go to the last one, okay? which is workplace learning. Now, workplace learning is a comprehensive tool that identifies because people learn for two days in a course, uh, and they go home, they go back to their, their companies, and they don't apply it. That means that you've wasted a lot of your money. The ROI is very low, because how much can you learn in two days, right? How much can you learn in two days? So workplace learning is a combination of learning facilitation, plus gamification, plus coaching, where after the class ends, they go back, and we help them to actually improve. Because coaching has been proven to help improve tra training plus coaching. Training plus coaching has an 88%, sorry, 88% uh, 
better chance of behavior change and upskilling than training alone, right? And and I say this as a trainer myself. I I I fully understand that when I send my participants back, there is an op, there is a chance they will not be able to use these skills. So I always offer post course coaching. So if you want it, okay. So let's let's do coaching afterwards so that they can improve their skills. And this is based on Charles Jennings, his theory of the 70-20-10. That learning is a long-term process, not a short-term process. You go to school and you learn, when do you apply? You apply much, much later on. But in training, you come for a two-day program. What happens next? You have 70% on the job. They need to apply it. When they don't apply it, or worse, the organization doesn't help them to apply it. And all of that is wasted. So I have I've had so many times where a customer or a client says, okay, we need communication skills. These people don't know how to communicate. I say, okay, come for the training. And then I send them back into the exact same environment. It's an environment that does not support. It is an environment that does not support them to apply the skills. We have problems like that in Malaysia, for example. Um, uh, Malaysians, uh, Malaysian government wants Malaysians to learn English to be able to be good at English. But here's the problem. The children learn English at school. When they go home, their parents don't support that. They don't, they don't have the ability to speak English to the children. Therefore, they have no practice. So it's nothing wrong with the parents. It's just that the environment at home cannot support that. So imagine you go for, for two-day training and you come back to the same environment in the, in the workplace, which does not support that. So a workplace learning is a long-term program that lasts for about three months at the minimum, where we send your particip- we take your participants, they come for a two-day training, and then we will help them over the next three months by intermed- uh, interval coaching. So some coaching we do face-to-face in your office. We will observe how you do work sometimes, and then we, we give you feedback on how you can improve. We get the managers involved, we get the supervisors involved, because they are the ones who see the participants every single day. So uh, in terms of workplace coaching, there are many, many different uh, tools that we can use. The one that the capacity specialist uses is called CZG. Uh, Peck and Rengzi, if you could type that in the text chat. Okay, so while they're typing that, Virek says, is it similar to the same as consultant? All right, so coaching by uh, very, very strict definition is not the same as consultant because a consultant is similar to a mentor. So if a consultant comes into the organization, the consultant will give you suggestions and advice based on what they see in your organization. A coach is usually one-on-one. Uh, you very rarely see a one coach with a lot of people. So coaching works best when it's one-on-one. That's why you have executive coaches. Executive coaches are people who work with CEOs, are people who work with leadership one-on-one to get them to work through their problems. You also have performance coaches. Performance coaches usually have to do with people who are stuck. They don't know how to improve. They don't know how to proceed. So a performance coach will come in and help you out, figure that out. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for the questions. So last one. Sivon says, I recognize that workplace learning is 70%. percent does mean to me that people have long year experiences. They have more knowledge than people short. Okay. So what we talk about here is in terms of learning something new. Um, there are people who have worked a long, long time that's on the job experience. What we're talking about is learning something new. So for example, communication skill. They come for a two-day program, right? After that, how do you know that the money you paid for that training is worthwhile if you don't see them apply it? Okay, so Sivon, thank you very much. I'm not referring to experience in terms of people have been working there for a long time. Okay, so that will be people who are, uh, are already learned. What I'm referring to is when we do interventions like training. We have to recognize that any training they go for, and this is, this is proven, you will, they will only take away 10%. The other 70% is in application, is in actual doing. So if they cannot do it back at the workplace because the manager doesn't support it or the, the supervisor doesn't support it, then where can they use it? It's, it becomes worthless. I've had participants who say, thank you very much, Mr. Nazrin, for your course. It's very helpful, but I don't think I can use this in my company. And I go, why? Well, because, you know, 
I can use, I can try this, but my manager will always say no. So that's what we say. Um, the organization itself has to take part in the 70%. Does that, does that answer your question? So Virak says, where to find executive and performance coaches? Well, speak to us. We'll find, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, good people who can help you out. Uh, Suffix says, how to make people apply that they have learned in their day. Okay, so that's another conversation that we can have. But in short, in short, HR has to talk to managers and supervisors to understand how to support their people. Uh, and, and you want to, to Google this term. We are running out of time, but I will answer this question. I, I want you to Google this term. There's a lot of research that tells us when people are not good, uh, they don't practice good manners in an organization. And you might think, what? This is, this is corporate world. Why are we talking about good manners? Well, there is strong research to show that people resign when they get cursed at, when they get scolded at. And when you are not the person being scolded, but you're the person in the room, while that person being scolded, even that person's motivation drops as well. So it's about creating an environment. You as the whole organization or you as the whole department needs to create a motivational environment for them to apply. So Sapek, a very short answer, a very complicated uh, answer, uh, um, put in a very short way, is how to make people apply. Well, you cannot make them apply. You need to give them the right environment. I'll give you an example. Nobody can make a tree grow. Nobody can physically hold a tree and force them, force it to grow. But if you give it the right soil, you give it enough water every day, you give it good aeration, right? Uh, you give it good, uh, uh, good environment to grow up in, then it will grow well. And that's the same for human beings as well. Okay, so informal learning. Formal learning is learning uh, in, the, in training, right? Informal learning is learning from other people like say, um, I don't know how to do this. How do I do this? I ask the person sitting next to me. Oh, okay. All you have to do is control C to copy, control V to paste. I see. Thank you very much. So that's informal learning. And only 20% of that happens in the workplace. On the job experience is learning on your own, making mistakes while you're applying. So does that answer your question? Thank you very much. All right. So we have come, we've actually exceeded time. I apologize, but I want to thank you because you are still here with me. We only have one last thing to do. We, are, we would like to know what you think because this is the first time we're doing this and we plan to have lots more in the future. Again, still free of charge. <laughs> we're not charging you for it, but we do want to help spread the, the, the news that there are things out there that you can use to improve your productivity, improve your performance in your organization. So we are going to give you a survey link. Either Ringzi or Peg is going to copy it into the text chat. Please click on that and fill in the survey so that we get a better idea of um, what we can do better uh, if you have any comments you'd like to make. So last but not least, before we go, please type into the text chat, um, what questions do you have? If you have no questions, type in an N to mean no, and I will know that we can finish. So if you have questions, type into the text chat. If you have no questions, type in an N, please. <laughs> Thank you, May. Coming in from Myanmar, very far away. <laughs> All right, if you have no questions, thank you very much. Um, feel free to connect with us if you have any further questions or you're shy or you thought of a question after we ended the, the, the session, that, that's fully understandable. So uh, from on behalf of the capacity specialists, let me just check, Peck and Rengze or Gabriel, is there anything you'd like to share before we go? Please type in the text chat. Can you send the survey link to email? Okay, so Peck and Rengze, if you could take care of that. Okay, cool. Again, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. And I hope to see you soon on another webinar. 
Have a good day. Have a good upcoming weekend. And talk to you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.